Hello and a very warm welcome to the old shop. It's quite a chilly late afternoon and I've lit the fire just a few minutes ago and it's going quite nicely which I'm pleased about because the rest of the house is a little bit chilly but anyway I wanted to say hello and just to tell you a little bit about today's episode of the old shop. I'm, start, I'm starting a little um, series telling you how I got to be here because several people have asked really the background and why I'm here on my own, uh, what the plan is, how I make a living, um, which is a very good question. Anyway, that, all that kind of thing. So the first episode today, I'm just going to talk a bit about what I did before I came here and um, what led up to looking for a, a house to live in. So hope you'll enjoy that and as well as that we've got a little bit about one of the family heirlooms that I brought back from my mum's house that I've been clearing and we're looking at the back garden to this time next time I'll take you to the front garden uh, because I'm getting on quite well with that so we've got to walk down the lane as well or a wet walk back up the lane as well and I was just so taken by how everything is stripped back to its essence at the moment I thought you might like to share that as well and I think that's probably it for this episode and hopefully uh, you'll find something in there to enjoy and join me by the fireside here and thank you very much for watching It's a slightly grey, soft day, but I decided to just do a little bit of videoing while I was walking along the lane uh, because I wanted to really show you how this time of year it's the most empty and the most see-through that the landscape ever is. It looks as if I'm in the middle of a heath somewhere, but actually I'm walking along the lane. I'm literally on a road where cars go. There's something quite magical, I think, every year about this time. You never quite realize quite how much more you're going to be able to see and it's just very exciting you get long vistas you realize how things are interconnected you didn't realize were you see the animal trails you can see here where the bracken is flattened even more where an animal has gone through from the lane and up onto the heath probably munchak but could be fox could be badger and some of the gorse is right out in flower like this and other other bushes are just buds. Uh, you can see a cross here as well and all the bare branches still. It's just, it's just as it's most stripped back and bleached and I think very beautiful. You never see this kind of scene normally right into the heath. Again all the time I, I'm just walking along the lane. I'm walking back. I've walked along the, to the end of the lane and I'm on my way back to the old shop. So this is just these are just the things I pass on the way and then home to have a nice cup of coffee. Neither of us would have guessed that we would fall, immediately fall in love and nobody wanted to spend our time together from then onwards. These are the first photographs we set up a camera and took photographs of us together and hadn't seen ourselves together before. And that was in a church called Little Witchingham where there were lovely wall paintings and subsequently we got married. These are photographs from our wedding day and we had a honeymoon in Venice. We became a self-employed partnership and we were working in all areas of heritage and publishing but part of our practice was our art practice and I continued to do my kind of strange installations and projects and lots of the time Trevor was there with me 
recording it all for me. These photographs were all taken by him of a project that I was doing at a medieval church over the course of a year following the festivals and the seasons. And he took this one as well of me carrying candles along exposure photography. Uh, this project came after that. It was to do with re-enchanting a rather run-down street, urban street in Norwich. And this one was to do with hills, the hills of Norfolk. And I was doing a performance here on a hill, or at least a Bronze Age barrow. As well as all that, which didn't earn any money, we used to just about scrape by um, with our paid work, a self-employed partnership, mostly the things Trevor could do really, to do with graphic design, logos, websites, and we used to do interpretation schemes. And we did some consultancy as well. This was a Iron Age replica village which we were consulted upon. And we had spent quite a lot of time there. We had really enjoyed ourselves there. And as, when we weren't doing the paid work, we were often to be found on barrows or up church towers. Um, here we are on top of Saul Church Tower together, or we were looking at stained glass, which was one of um, Trevor's passions. And we started running our own guided walks, which we used to call art and archaeology performance walks. This one was at Godwick, a medieval village, and this one was to do with Samhain or Hallow Hallowtide. And one of the walks was picked up by a reporter on the local Eastern Daily Press and they ran a three page article about us and our walks. They came along on one of our walks and then wrote it all up, which was really, really wonderful for us. But suddenly tragedy struck and my son Adam died of an undiagnosed brain tumour literally overnight. And then Trevor, who you can see here pointing at a buzzard over a mountain, three days after my son's funeral, uh, was diagnosed with incurable cancer. And after a really awful illness, he sadly died on Christmas Day 2016. Now, we hadn't prepared for this in any way emotionally or financially at all. I really was left um, floundering. I had no idea how I was going to be able to make a living on my own or what I would do. I I did silly things to start with, like having a buzzard painted onto his drum, taking it up to Warham Camp, which is one of the places we like to go. But eventually I decided that I was going to move from our house. Cutting a long story very short, including oh, losing a cottage I set my heart on when it was withdrawn, after the contracts had been already been signed and the indescribable amount of work that it took to clear everything um, that he'd had there that I hadn't even known about that he's collected over the 24 years that he'd had the house. As I'd sold our house I decided to go ahead anyway and move out and find somewhere to rent over the winter. So I found somewhere, it was actually a furnished holiday cottage, but I got it at a favourable rate for a winter let for six months. This was the scene when I had pushed all my things into the kitchen. It was like this for weeks. I had to kind of man manoeuvre my way around the kitchen, around all the stuff. There was stuff in the hallway, there was stuff everywhere. I, was really, I found it really, really difficult. And at the same time, because it was furnished, I had loads of stuff put into storage, which was expensive, and loads of stuff at my mum's house, masses of stuff there too. So all in all, um, it was not an easy time, but I discovered my bedroom faced southeast, as it had done in our old home, and I could watch the sunrise every morning. And it was Advent shortly after this, and every day during Advent, I decided I was going to photograph the sunrise as soon as I woke up, and I was posting it on Facebook at the time. And that proved to be a real salvation in its own way. At the same time as this, I was house hunting. I was actually going in to a state agent and looking for a cottage somewhere to move to. Uh, time was running out and I lost a couple more that I loved. Uh, but I, I discovered just along the lane, not only was there a very remarkable church I just showed you a picture of, but also there was a fishing lake, which was an old clay pit. And I started taking my coffee there almost every day and just spending time by the lake. And it became a ritual, but I knew it was going to close on the 31st of March because there was a sign on the gate. I really hoped it was wrong. 
I went on the 1st of April, which was Easter Day, which is when this photograph, I took this photograph and it was still open and I thought, oh, there's been a mistake, this is wonderful. But in fact, I went back and it was padlocked. And just to cut another very long story short, I was given a key. And so I had that lake all to myself until it was going to reopen on the 1st of June. It was the most special privilege I can actually ever remember having. I had the most amazing spring. Even though I was looking for houses and having disappointments the whole time, I, I saw the swans arriving. I watched wild geese come in and bring up their babies, have their babies hatch. I used to sit there and just luxuriate in it, really. I knew it would come to an end at some point, but the kind person who had a key cut for me, and that's another story, told me just to hang it up on this particular nail hidden away when I had to move it out. And that's what I did, because by this time I had found what became my new home, the old shop. Wow, this is so big and heavy. I can't really, um, can't really show you how heavy it is. You'd have to come around and have a pick a try and pick it up, and then you'd kind of get some idea. It's really hard for me to give any idea of the size of this. Let me put my hands here. It's absolutely huge. It's one of the things I brought back from my mum's house. I didn't even know was there. Uh, it's not that she was in the habit of looking at the Bible. In fact, it doesn't really look as if it was, once you open it, it doesn't really look as if anyone ever looked at it. But I think it's the kind of thing that most families had, a family Bible in their house somewhere, even if they didn't have many other books. And this has come from her mum and dad's family. They're so beautiful though, the way they used to produce them. This is all um, embossed in here and the edges of it here are as you kind of would expect, raised like this as well. It's got a little bit rubbed on the on the spine there. And as I was just um, was opening, you can see those catches and this, all this brass work. And it's all gilded on the edges as well, or would have been. And we, I had a look at it at my mum's house, just to kind of see what it was. And I couldn't, I just had to bring it home, really. I just couldn't really just let that go to um, wherever the other books are going to go to, which I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> But anyway, I don't know if I'm going to look at it as such, apart from just as a curiosity, because it just is so heavy. You wouldn't want to be carrying it around or handling it very much, really. But it's got these wonderful illustrations in it and protected by this thin tissue. See, there's one. I don't know. It probably says inside what the era it's from. I suppose it's Victorian. And I noticed inside as well, there are some certificates and things, which I'll show, find to show you. Look at the pictures. It's an amazing thing to have. I'm really, really glad to have brought it back, actually, even though I'm not quite sure where I'm going to put it. The old shop is fairly full. Um, look at this. Isn't that amazing? It's honestly as bright as if it was new and the pages aren't worn at all, which I think speaks to the fact it probably was just there because you needed to have a Bible. It's called the National Comprehensive Family Bible. And with commentaries and explanatory notes. And I think when I was actually there and having a look, I saw some old family certificates. Um, I don't know if they were for Sunday school attendance, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to um, have a look for those and I'll see if I can find them rather than, I can't lift the, I can't lift this up to have a, have to flip through it. So I'm going to have to, um, there's something here. Oh, maybe this is them. Let's see what this is. Put this on the outside. So we've got Empire Day, 1916. That would have been, of course, during the First World War. It was uh, presented to Joyce Ashmore. That would have been my great aunt. Yeah, my granddad's sister. And this one's another Empire Day. That was Leonard Ashmore. That was my granddad's brother. I can, I can see where this is going now. And they were younger than him. He was, in the, he was actually in the Middle East, uh, in Egypt and Palestine in 1916 as an ambulance driver. Another one for Joyce Ashmore. Um, Christmas Day gifts. Oh, it's a thank you for donating Christmas Day gifts for children. Um, 
well, you can see our brave soldiers and sailors. Gosh, I haven't seen anything like this before. And there's another Happy Christmas. That was for Hugh Ashmore. So that was my granddad's brother as well. And Hugh is their family name. So that's uh, yeah, another one of these happy um, school children of the empire who sent Christmas gifts to our brave soldiers and sailors. And there's another one. I, don't, I haven't actually seen anything about this particular phenomenon anywhere else, but I'm sure so many children everywhere would have got these certificates. But whether everyone still got them, I don't know. That's 1915. And that was inside the Bible. I think that when, if, you, if um, old Bibles get discovered in people's families, they've often got the important little documents and certificates people didn't know quite what to do with. They used to tuck them inside the Bible. I'm absolutely thrilled with this, actually. I'm going to treasure it. The more of the illustrations I'm uncovering, the more fascinating it is. As you can see, this is the, it must be the New Testament now, and the sailors in, I guess they're the fishermen. Well, they are the fishermen, aren't they? And Jesus here with his halo. And then look at the birds we've got all looking in as well. I suppose they're storks, probably. No, not storks. They're probably cranes, are they? If anyone knows, let me know. This one's entitled The Lilies of the Field. It's even got a map of Jerusalem in it, which I shall look at later because I have no idea of the geography of it. This is the only place where it's actually fallen to pieces a little bit. I don't know why this particular page, you can see it's quite worn there, but it's, uh, it says underneath it's St. Peter healing a lame man. I mean, I'm not going to go through and look at every single picture. This one's called Blessed of the Peacemakers. But I just find it so fascinating, these kind of earnest Victorian faces, which look as if they've actually been possibly copied um, from, you know, some of the people that were known, actually known to the artist of the time. It's also got the Lord's Prayer in 14 languages, it says, which is, uh, um, I wonder which 14 they've chosen at that era, in that era. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, they thought it would, would be relevant. We've got Chinese, Greek, Latin, Hindustani, Danish, Swedish, Dutch, German, French, Spanish, Italian, Welsh. That's it. And of course, English. I have to have a look and see what date it actually is. I haven't looked at the front to see what date it is. I'm just, this is actually the first time I've really opened it, apart from just when I was at my mum's house, having a look to see whether I was going to bring it or not. And I decided that I would. I'm so glad I did. I have to say, it's like, it's an amazing thing. I don't know very much about the Bible. Um, I have to say, oh, look, it's a colour picture, Hannah's Vow. Wow, that's all I can say, really. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really even know that everyone kind of, in fact, I even did RE O level as it was in those days, you know, GCSE. Uh, but that was really because um, I was quite good at essays and so on. And so I picked topic, subjects where you would have to do essay questions, uh, which was a bit of a cheat on my part because I was better at that than things like maths. Although you had to do maths as well anyway. But yeah, I did RE, but we didn't do a lot of Bible stuff. It was like all sorts of uh, comparative religions and so on. And um, and although, yeah, and I sort of know a little bit, of course, but the Bible is just so much, there's <laughs> so much of it. Um, as not the, the bits that we, the kind of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John bits are, are tiny compared to all the rest of the Bible. I've read a few words of the preface and I think that's kind of convinced me I'm very unlikely to be reading it in any great detail. It says things like, I'll just give you an example, the interests of true religion are threatened by two antagonists, very opposite in their nature, but ominously united in opposition to a simple and spiritual gospel. We do not allude to undisguised and honest scepticism and popery, but to peculiar and seductive forms of both those malignant errors to be found within the pale of the Protestant churches. The truth as it is in Jesus is menaced by ritualism on the one hand and rationalism on the other. 
Alas, how many are there who place their hope of salvation in the observance of mere ceremonial and the classical, I, I, I can't say it, ecclesiastical routine who are deluded by the figment of sacramental efficacy and the miserable deceit of baptismal regeneration who kneel before an altar without a sacrifice and do homage to a priesthood without divine right or consecration blah blah so yes i'm seeing it in a slightly different light to all that um yeah what i'm reminded of when i'm looking at these pictures and and in fact the bible in general really is an experience i had ages ago decades ago i suppose in the 90s it was before i went to art school and i went to an exhibition at a local kind of um, art center a sort of workshop uh, artist studios in fact it was and they were having an open evening and i just happened to overhear a conversation there was a young man uh, who is looking with some friends at the paintings and one of the paintings was some sort of religious allegory maybe it was something like this I don't know I can't remember at all now maybe Jesus was in this I can't remember but it was really interesting because I just overheard this snatch of what he said which was something like I have to learn all of this imagery anew it's all completely new to me because I was brought up in a witch family and we didn't have any imagery like this I always stayed with me because at that point I didn't know that there really was such a living thing as witchcraft or families who had this that kind of heritage or had that continuity. It was often said that it's an, a new thing which has been devised as a new age, uh, well, you know, from Wicker onwards at least. And maybe, maybe that this young man's family that was the case but it was quite a long time ago it was before this current uh, phase when we see a lot of out in the open a lot of mainstream oh, I don't know websites and shops and all sorts of things going on really but in at that point there really wasn't so it felt very authentic and I I kind of went right through me really oh which family and he was really open to looking at the religious imagery and trying to puzzle it out but he just was curious because it was all completely new to him as I guess it is to a lot of people as well I mean we don't all um, look at pictures of Jewish captives in Babylon all the time at all or any of the other pictures we've been looking at but at the same time we wouldn't probably say that so anyway I should shut it up now and I'll put the clasps into place uh, and just to think that most most households actually did have um, you know if they if they had any sort of I don't know what the word is really pretensions is probably the wrong word but if they felt that they were a respectable household at least they would have something like this and I, I know from what my mum said as a child they, she didn't really have books particularly she had every book was precious but there was there would be a bible it's getting a bit chilly now uh, it does still get chilly quite early in the afternoon quite surprisingly early I think but I thought we'd have a quick whiz around the back garden anyway I can't quite remember where we left it last time but I'm very proud of this bed here that I have actually cleared and tidied and I made new edging I mean it's only like bricks laid in place it's not noth nothing fixed or anything but it's made a big difference and I had some wood chip at the front just piled up still and so I've used that just to go around everything so just for a little while at least it is all looking extraordinarily um, neat and tidy and I've cut down the old stems of things like this hyssop this is the herb bed basically um, you have various herbs and there's the white whorehounds there and this is golden marjoram here and rue but I mean I'm pointing at all these things they all probably look the same at the moment but you know it's poised for action just in time for the freeze we're going to have next week apparently it's going to be sleet and a little bit of snow um, during next week it feels like minus two that kind of thing again so I think I might have been a little bit premature this is where I had a fire I've been piling up my um, dry stuff here this is a casualty of a spade a friend of mine was helping um, and suddenly there were two halves of the spade but I found one, another spade it's not great but I found another spade at my mum's so I shall be using that until I can you know if it's okay I'll use it it doesn't look it looks a bit blunt but we'll see this is the um, 
sea buckthorn just coming up into leaf and then quite a few things are actually oh I just noticed this is an apricot tree and I have noticed it's got pink flower buds but look the first ones I don't want to really I don't want to break the flower bud off the flower off actually so I won't try and pull it round to show you but that might be a bit easier to see I'm afraid you know it's not going to like this cold weather that's coming coming out on all good faith but um we'll have to just have to see this is this is always this is always the danger isn't it at this time of year in March you just never know what's going to happen with the weather and the plants I guess they usually one way or another it evens itself out in the end I also noticed something rather lovely because I've shown you the snowdrops before but I noticed that there's some violets just one little clump of violets out I just absolutely love it when these wild plants come by themselves and part of me thinks we shouldn't be too fussy and say well we want that one because it's a violet but we don't want that one because it's ground uh, ivy or bittercress or you know dandelion or something we don't want that one but we want this one or a buttercup so I think yeah as far as I can I'm going to, I mean obviously not bindweed I'm going to make an exception for that but as far as I can I'm going to let things that want to be in places be there look this uh, is a daffodil that's come up there by itself I guess there were probably some bulbs just in the soil or in the compost that I put in you know put around things and it's coming up and the beautiful oh, I absolutely love aquilegias I know a lot of you do as well and look at the way the little bit of rain we've had look how it's forming those beautiful droplets crystal droplets in the leaves there which is something you associate with Alcamilla mollis um, which is you know ladies mantle which is why it's called Alcamilla because it's like the little drops are like alchemists um, well you know something alchemists might use or produce uh, but anyhow this obviously also happens with the aquilegias as well because I can see another one over there and that's done the same thing so we'll just um, have a quick walk through this is I know it doesn't look much I do understand that it doesn't look much but I have done some work out here and what one of the things I've done is I've kind of established if I step back oh this is the other part of the spade actually I'm afraid it's got to go in the dustbin oh no it's not this is fork no I can keep that um I'll leave it there for the moment apart from cutting down low some of the things like these dogwoods um, along the edges here that are going to be more like a shrub layer or a hedge uh, there's more to do in that area but what I've done is I've kind of tried to divide it so we've got I know it's really hard to see with all the junk as well through the trees or well, not junk but clutter <laughs> buckets and things but anyway try and use your imagination and on this side if you I know it's hard I haven't done anything to prepare for this which is why you'll be able to see things like um, old buckets and things upside down but anyway what I want to try and try to demonstrate is that what I've done is I've cut, tried to re-establish this path through the middle so you can walk through the middle of the woodland and then on each side you've got the baby trees so there's one area of baby trees here and then one area of the trees on this side of me as well so what I'm continuing to do really is I'm making a way through here I've got some more lovely snowdrops down here and also what are these celandines they must have been mixed up with them um, quite a few mole hills as well which is very pleasing and here now I made a well I made a few quite a few mistakes in this garden actually some of which I'm having to live with and some of which I'm kind of trying to adjust as I go along but one of them was I had five of these wild pear plants which sounds beautiful wild pear but they are so prickly and obviously you don't get pears they are I say obviously but they, they you don't get pears they are just because they're a native species and they're nice to put into hedges in fact it was bought as a hedging like a little hedging stick really I bought a bundle of five well I put them in and they are just so spiny that I just show a spine I mean you think blackthorn is spiny but this is worse that's the spine I, I was cutting them down and I actually got one of them went through the bottom of my rubber boot which is quite a thick boot and it went through the sole it went through the lining and it went right that spiked right into my foot 
Anyway, so four of the five, and they, by the way, they love it here. <laughs> Ironically, look how that has thickened out, considering it was just that little tiny one stem stick thing. And uh, it's big, not quite as tall as the alders, but it's getting there. It's probably not far off, actually. Anyway, there were five of them, and four of them I've had to take out. Um, just yeah it's just not tenable really but this one had i guess it's the most established or the most you know the one that's actually biggest and thickest and happiest it's uh it started putting out these little flowers the blossom and i just actually hadn't got the heart to cut it down and um yeah i just haven't got the heart to get it, cut it down so i'm going to keep one i mean it is so beautiful isn't it it's just a beautiful little tree so this is this one is going to represent all the wild pears that would otherwise have been here. That is not my only mistake, I can assure you, but that one it has been fairly easy to put right. So another mistake that I've made, just to go through my mistakes, um, was the sweet chestnuts trees. Because again, got very carried away. I had a bundle of five trees. They haven't grown big like the one I've just shown you at all, but they are sturdy and they have the most enormous leaves. They have, even though they're little tiny baby trees, really, the leaves, I'll show you a leaf, they're full size, they're big, and they're just everywhere. And I just think, actually, they're not, the scale of them isn't suitable for this garden. When you look at the other leaf fall, which of course is natural in the woodlands, and in fact, it'll help to help the trees to, you know, give, it'll give them nutrition over time. But the, these are out of proportion and they're just covering the whole garden. And not only that, it wouldn't matter in the woodland area, but around the edges where I've got beds and I've got soft fruit and I've got ponds, it, they're just getting everywhere, basically. And the trees themselves will be too big for the space anyway. So they're going to have to go as well. I'm hoping to find good homes for those, though, because or I might be able to perhaps rehome them myself in the wild. I haven't really thought it through properly yet. I just know they've got to go. One of the other things I've done is disentangle a lot of the old bindweed stems, just browned, you know, finished bindweed stems, but surprising how tightly it still clings. So I think it was been a good idea to release everything from 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 that, which has also been that's been a very rewarding job to do. But I'm really aware of how much more there is to do and I've got a huge amount to do that I want to do in the house as well. So, and obviously I enjoy making the videos and I'm also writing at the moment, writing my Substack newsletter, which I'll link in below, which I'm putting out every new moon and full moon, which I really enjoy, because I love writing. But it just is really hard, to be honest. It's just really hard to fit everything in and know where to put the energies for the best. I'm not particularly good at that. But following my heart, but you know, spring's coming and there's a lot of really exciting um, growth happening in the garden. I'm really looking forward to having another year to really try to co-create with nature, basically, and to make something here which is productive and healthy and benefiting wildlife and just really being an asset to everybody and every and everyone I share it with if it can inspire anybody else who's got a smallish garden but wants to try to use it in a more natural way but also hopefully anyway productive in this climate of food shortages food expensive foods and so on because I haven't talked yet about the vegetable growing or anything but there are lots of fruit bushes here and I'm hoping this year will be the year they start to be, they actually really start to come into their own, which of course we'll follow along. Look at these gorgeous little clusters forming on the sea buckthorn. This is another prickly plant, but it's kind of contained in a, in a row here. I've made a little row of, of sea buckthorn, which is going to make a kind of um, shelter belt, I suppose, around this area here, which is going to be grass. So I've got it. I've got it sort of in my mind of how it'll be. It's uh, just a question of making it reality. <laughs> just a small question of making it reality. So watch this space and I hope you'll join me next time and we'll see what's been happening because even in a week or two's time, I'm hoping to have made a bit more progress here 
and obviously we'll be seeing a lot more activity of birds which are starting the birds are starting to flutter around i'd like i hope the blackbirds might come back to their nest in the bay tree um, i think i shall know because it's full of old dead bay leaves the nest so if i see they've started to be cleared out and move things are moving around i shall know that they're interested in that site again and of course i'll let you know as well so look forward to that and see you again soon bye